let's talk about the effects of trauma on the human psyche. In my opinion, it's very hard, if not impossible, to understand what is going on with us as individuals, with other people, and indeed largely in societies, in the whole world, without a understanding of trauma. Robert Scare, the leading traumatologist, now sadly at the end of his life, believes that all human pathology is a result of trauma. In recent years, the term complex PTSD was coined. And what that basically means is that rather than having suffered one trauma, a person has accumulated the effects of several little traumas, or rather the overall effects of an environment that was suboptimal to their development. And while I'm sometimes sceptical of psychiatric diagnoses, I think the term complex PTSD is pretty useful because as a therapist, I've sometimes had people come to me saying, you know, I've got these symptoms or these conditions or these blocks. And I've always been trying to think, like, what did this come from? And I can't think of a particular event. And I've said to them, well, it's not necessarily one event that might precondition you in that way. It could just be the environment, the overall, the general feeling. If there was constantly tension in your house when you're growing up, you adapt to that. If you didn't get the amount of attention that you need, uh, you adapt to that. Whatever the conditions are when you're growing up, you adapt to it. One of the things that's made human beings so successful as a species is our unprecedented ability to adapt to our environment. That's why we're on every continent in the world. The fetus doesn't know what country, what culture it's going to be born into, whether it's going to be born into a violent environment or a peaceful environment. So it's equipped to adapt. How one adapts to their environment can vary from person to person. If the environment at home is really punishing, someone might adapt by becoming really intensely independent very early on and get out of the house as much as possible. Whereas another person might adapt by, well, what they call fawning now, which is becoming really effective at avoiding conflict by sucking up to authority. Those may be preconditioned by other factors. I'm not saying that there's no genetic predispositions or personality dispositions that we have. Obviously, everything is a combination of nature and nurture, but even the term nature and nurture is incomplete because all expression of humanity or personality is the expression of genes and environment. Right? So there's, there's not really a clear distinction between nature and nurture. Everything is the expression of a precondition in conditions, if, if you like. So I am of the belief that everyone, pretty much, to some degree, if we take the term at face value, is to some degree traumatised or is suffering to some degree from complex PTSD. That might sound like a radical notion, but stick with me through the podcast and see if it makes sense to you by the end of what we're talking about here. One of the reasons for this is, in the early stages of life, the human being is extraordinarily vulnerable. I mean, we are born, we are all born prematurely, technically, because... The human head, the cranium, because we've got such big brains, is too big to pass through uh, the woman's vagina when the brain's fully developed. So as a consequence of that, we're born early. The evolution has hit a roadblock because our heads have got bigger, but, the, but physically a woman's hips couldn't 
actually become any wider and bigger. Otherwise, you know, we just snap, they just snap in half. So nature has drawn a line for us, which in this physical form, we can actually exceed. And because of that, because we're born so helpless, many, man many mammals can walk within a couple of hours of being born. You know, they can do most of the things they need to do within weeks or months, whereas we really can't. So we're extremely vulnerable, the brain's still forming, and we're vulnerable to trauma because we can't actually meet any of our needs. And when you're a baby in your crib, the not getting the attention you need or not getting fed in time, you know, even a few hours or, you know, God forbid, half a day, whatever your, your needs happen to be, is like an eternity to you. So we're very vulnerable from that respect. There's a, a psychologist, Donald Winnicott, talked about having a good enough mother. The obvious implication being that uh, a good enough mother is probably about the best uh, we, we can hope to get because there is no mother that's sufficiently qualified to perfectly meet all uh, young helpless infants' needs. Parents aren't omnipotent, they're not uh, omnipresent, they've got their own needs, they've got other concerns and things like that. So they can't always be there in a judicious time to take care of our needs when we're babies. Add to that, we don't exactly go into education systems that are aimed at the flourishing of the whole human being, whether that's by design, whether that was some kind of conspiracy brought forth from the Industrial Revolution to turn us into robots, or, you know, people when they created the education system uh, are doing the best they know how to do and there's just inertia set into the system, so reforms are slow to be made. I mean, there's been stuff coming out since the 60s. More recently, Alfie Cohn has written book after book after book on education, on evidence-based reforms to the education system. And it's only in the progressive schools that any of these have been taken on. Um, so there's inertia in the system and I'm sure even if they did integrate the insights from these thinkers and researchers, we still wouldn't have a perfect education system, but we at least know how to improve it a lot more than we have. The other thing is, the human being is just susceptible to trauma. Being traumatized is essentially a survival defense mechanism. It's designed to protect the organism from dying if a similar experience to the one that traumatized that organism arises. And not only that, but it's not widely understood how to reverse the effects of trauma. I mean, there's really great information on YouTube, such as by Alan Shore, Robert Scare. These are really great popularizers of the neuroscience of trauma. And yet, they've not really filtered into the mainstream. Even in psychotherapy, the profession that I'm in, I, I would hazard a guess that most practicing therapists don't have a full understanding of trauma. I mean, Lord knows, I, I don't have a full understanding of trauma. I know enough to share about it. I know enough to help my clients with it, but I, I'm not an expert. I'm not a traumatologist. I just have integrated these insights based on my own process of self-healing and then trying to help the people that I work with. So I guess it would make sense at this point to define what is a trauma. Well, Robert Scare, a leading traumatologist defines uh, trauma as as any real or perceived threat to a person's life and that real or perceived is extraordinarily important that is experienced in a state of helplessness so you can perceive a threat to your life and you might not feel helpless you might go into your fight response or you might go into your flight response and run away and you may not suffer a trauma. But what can happen is that you feel helpless. So it's any real or perceived threat to a person's life that is experienced in a state of helplessness. So what happens when we suffer a trauma is that the brain reacts, but it doesn't unreact. There's some kind of reaction to the state of helplessness and the brain goes, well, I survived that incident by adopting this strategy. Therefore, 
This is clearly a winning survival strategy. This is going to allow me to survive. Now, the part of the brain that is influenced by trauma does not care about your quality of life. It cares about the fact that you have life. At any juncture, any choice between your survival and your happiness to this primitive part of your brain, survival will always win. Now this has great explanatory power because it's remarkable how much potential we do have to learn and adapt and change as human beings. And very high functioning people really do do that. They're constantly learning. Trauma traps us in the surviving paradigm. The only animals who don't discharge trauma after experiencing it are, are lab animals, zoo animals, pets, and human beings. Dig that. Lab animals, pets, zoo animals, and human beings. Why? Because they all live in a cage. <laughs> the first two live in literal cages, and the third ones, well, pets. And pets, well, they're preconditioned by their social environment with us, and we are preconditioned. We are in a cage of sorts, which is society. Society that doesn't understand trauma, doesn't understand that trauma needs to be discharged, and doesn't encourage the discharging of trauma. So that is an important indication that we've got kind of far from nature. We've got far from our nature. And nature has given us a way to overcome our wounds, but we're not in touch enough with our bodies to discharge those wounds. There are several approaches modalities that I think there's reason to believe can be effective. One is trauma release exercises, which I've mentioned before. Two other ones, which we're not going to explore today, but you can do a little bit of research yourself, are somatic experiencing and EMDR. Another is bioenergetics, developed by Alexander Lowen, who was a student of Wilhelm Reich, who was a student of Freud. And each of those develop the ideas of their mentor, I think, for the, mostly for the better. Um, I don't agree with all their views, but I really, really believe in Alexander Lone's findings. I really am into forms of work that involve the body, not just the mind. I mean, I'm a talk therapist, but I'm always, always, always bringing my client's attention back to their body. What are you experiencing? Can you put your attention on your emotions? And People get trauma triggers all the time when they're working with me and I know enough about working with trauma and I've done enough self-healing that I know how to deal with those when they come up and talk them through them and also teach them to become more resourceful in dealing with that. Try and see if you can regulate yourself when you're talking about a uh, incident like this, whatever the triggering incident was, to keep your level of emotion about 6.8 out of 10. If you're feeling very well resourced, you can allow it to turn up to 7.2 maximum. Anything more than that, you might lose control. Really losing control of yourself in a therapy situation, becoming so overcome with anxiety or fearfulness or anything like that, for a short time might be okay, for a long time, really dangerous. You can actually re-traumatize yourself when you're triggered and your emotions completely overwhelm you. So there's a process of helping people tune into their emotions enough so that they can observe them, so they can be with them, so they can talk through them and remove the imprint from their emotional system so that they're actually clearing themselves of the accumulation of emotion, accumulation of the effects of trauma. Let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I'm a humble country neurologist from Boulder, Colorado, uh, who for 20 years ran a rehab center. I didn't do clinical neurology after the first 10 years of practice. I did rehabilitation medicine, and I ran brain, brain injury programs, stroke programs, and chronic pain programs. And about 10 to 12 years ago, I had this, you know, awakening on the road to Damascus or something like that, where I suddenly realized that trauma was the cause for all the distress in many of the patients that I saw who needed rehabilitation, especially chronic pain. 
And I discovered that many, if not most, of my chronic pain patients, in fact, had child abuse. And then I discovered that all of the 10,000 whiplash patients I'd seen had the trauma and the whiplash syndrome proportionate to their lifetime burden of trauma. That the whiplash syndrome was not a physical injury per se, it was an experience which changed the body. And the back pain, the neck pain, pain, the dizziness, the visual problems, the emotional problems, all the things that happened with, with whiplash had a very logical basis in the memory for the events of that experience, which then were replicated <clears throat> in all the physical sensations of the injury. And that's what a lot of people were talking about up here. That's what Carol was uh, talking about when she worked with chronic pain in the back and neck and, the, and these things. And that's why EFT works. I also realized that most of the chronic diseases to which we're subject also have their roots in the complicated way the brain processes traumatic experiences and the physiology of that process and how it affects the body. And so I wrote this book called The Body Bears the Burden, which now is obvious that it is the burden of trauma. And I mean the experience of trauma, not the physical changes of an injury per se. And I will explain in this talk why that happens, how the physiology operates, how it connects with the body and with the symptoms that one sees in chronic disease. And you'll come away with a new idea, I hope, which fits directly into how EFT works. And then I'll actually talk about what is the common ingredient in healing trauma and how does that relate to the various techniques that are out there, especially energy psychology. I take a different tack. I don't talk about energy per se, although I, the, the body is an energetic organ. There is a, a field that is perceptible and some people can even feel it, see it. But the brain is what processes all of this. And the brain actually changes the body in ways uh, that don't need to come from outside ideas about the way the body is constructed. So this is not an easy talk. It's complex. I will make it lay friendly within the limits of what I can do. I will talk about some Latin terms like amygdala and hippocampus and things like that, just to have you understand and hear once how the brain processes it. And that also is necessary to explain how trauma works and try how trauma healing works. So it will be challenging, but I will try to make it uh, as clear as I can. And I'm I will be signing books and answering questions for as long as people need after here. Well, I love the history of trauma because the history of trauma shows that back 150 years ago, brilliant physicians understood and know and knew and recognized what we now are beginning to recognize years later. And this begins back in the last part of the 19th century at the Salpetriere, a hospital in um, Paris that housed criminals and what were called hysterics. And Jean-Marie Sarko, Jean Sarko, who was a neurologist, studied hysteria with great interest because hysteria or conversion reaction is a neurological syndrome involving paralysis, seizures, loss of speech, collapse, fainting spells, numbness and tingling, and a host of neurological symptoms which were felt to be at least at that time, malingering. They called it hysteria because 90% were women, and history, hysteria derives from the, the word hystera, which is the uterus. And people called it the, the wandering of the uterus in these women. Well, um, Breuer and his student Freud came to study at the Salpetriere with Charcot in the late 1880s. <laughs> And they discovered that if you talk to these women, which nobody had ever bothered to do that, they had what they called reminiscences. And the reminiscences often involved childhood events. And in fact, when they really got to the heart of matters with every one of these women, everyone was a victim of incest. They all were victims of childhood sexual abuse. Um, Freud was in tranced with this concept, wrote a brilliant article called The Etiology of Hysteria, and was criticized, marginalized, and almost cast out of many societies 
because the fathers of these women were often middle-class prominent citizens of Paris and Vienna. And as a result, uh, at the expense of his uh, honesty and his integrity, he recanted and said that actually their hysteria derived from their incestuous lusts of their fathers, which was unacceptable, so they turned this into neurological symptoms which were disabling. They recanted, basically, he and Breuer. Uh, Pierre Genet was a psychologist at the time who uh, also studied this. He understood hysteria. He described it in great detail, and his works today show that he understood things now that are just beginning to be re-examined and re-understood regarding the body and trauma. And he was, as a result, ostracized. Uh, Charcot presented these women at his Tuesday morning lectures. The audience was composed of uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and luminaries like great actresses and uh, politicians and the like who would come to see him demonstrate how he could trigger a hysterical attack in these women by touching a certain point on their body. It was always the same point for each woman. And there would be a point, it could be on the arm, it could be on the leg, most of it was in the lower part of the abdomen, big surprise there. And this triggered a hysterical attack, which often was a swoon in this case, or it could be a, a hemiplegia or a collapse and paralysis of the legs. So he demonstrated this in this sort of a circus at the time. Genet talked about fixed ideas, idea fixe, the spectrum of symptoms, which included body symptoms, somatic symptoms, emotional, uh, perceptual symptoms where there was blindness or loss of speech, uh, all triggered by a cue that related to the trauma. And the fact that these events occur with a specific cue is very important to the whole understanding of trauma and how it expresses itself in the body. They also had absent-mindedness. They were cognitively impaired. They had memory deficits. And abulia, the inability to initiate action. In other words, they were often frozen in space, unable to move. And as I said, cues in the environment were noted to trigger this often. And sure enough, these, these are pictures from some of the Salpetriere patients. All of them had neurological signs. This woman has what looks like is a hemiplegia, paralysis of the right side of her body. This woman looks like she is having a seizure, or actually this is the posture that the accident victim from an auto accident comes into where there's severe brain injury. It's called decerebrate rigidity. How did these women know that that's how the brain works? How did they know this? They didn't know this because hysteria is a physiological syndrome. We now know if you do energy scans of the brain that the parts of the body that are impaired, the, the representative area of the brain is also impaired objectively, in this so-called psychological syndrome. So psychology, neurology, uh, these are the same thing. The brain and the mind of the body are all a continuum. And one can have, in a psychological syndrome, evidence for physiological changes in the brain. Well, in World War I, which is a unique war because it was fought in trenches, the soldiers developed an unusual syndrome. Even as early as, as the uh, Civil War, where there was a uh, diagnosis called soldier's heart, soldiers were known to suffer from emotional distress in battle. In World War I, however, these soldiers were helpless much of the time. They were in the trenches, they were being bombarded, they had no way to protect themselves, and they developed was, uh, dissociative symptoms. We talked about dissociation uh, briefly, and they basically got stuck in postures and positions which reflected the last act that they, of self-defense that they attempted before they became totally helpless. And these postures reflect the same type of thing that you see with the, uh, the hysterical women. And then Sandor Ferenczi, who was a contemporary of Freud, described a tick. Everybody knows what a tick is. It's a habit spasm or a muscle movement that's repetitive and compulsive and seen in, in uh, times of... Uh, of stress as an overstrong memory fixation on the attitude of the body at the moment of trauma. It was a self-protective mechanism which stayed after the traumatic event. 
Why would it stay? Well, we're going to talk about that. Every time you see somebody with an eye twitch, a face twitch, a shoulder twitch, a clearing of their throat, a cough, that represents an old memory for a trauma that was never resolved. The roots of trauma require two elements, a threat to survival and helplessness. Trauma does not occur unless you're helpless. A threat to survival, of course, is relative. And Carol talked briefly about many traumas. That's the topic of my second book, The Trauma Spectrum. Any negative life event that's severe enough to compromise your well-being and therefore probably your survival, where you have no control, assumes the quality of trauma, threat to survival and helplessness. And what that causes, of course, is what, I can't remember your name, what you experienced, the freeze. Dissociation and the freeze are connected. The freeze response is the, the thing of most importance in, in the study of trauma. The freeze response is, is what the opossum does when he's run to the ground. He falls, he's immobile, he's feigning death. No, he's not. It's a physiological, unconscious, instinctual response. It's associated with flooding of the brain and body with endorphins, so you can't feel pain. It's associated with parasympathetic tone. The vagus nerve is the nerve that gover governs the operations of the viscera, the heart, lungs, and, and intestinal tract. And that organ, that, that neurological state is a high parasympathetic or vagal state, like when you're digesting food. But it's, as you'll see, a very profound state, which can be life-threatening. If you've been running to escape, you've been in a sympathetic dominant fight-flight activity, high pulse rate, high heart rate, energy expenditure. If then you go into the freeze response, which is just the opposite, immobility, vagal, parasympathetic, you may for a while be in this wild state of hyper cycling between sympathetic and parasympathetic dominance. It's sort of the brake analogy phenomenon, the brake accelerator uh, analogy. Uh, we mentioned endorphins, they're released in arousal. Endorphins are what allow you to escape if you're wounded. That's why soldiers don't feel pain for a while after the wound, how they can continue to battle even though they're wounded and then realize that uh, they're, they're mortally wounded. It mediates the freeze response as well. So during the freeze response, you're numb. And it's actually a state of analgesia and also, if you think of it that way, of mild pleasure because there's no sensation, thinking is dulled, and you're not in pain or terror anymore. Freud described hypnosis, which in, a, in, a, in some senses is related to the freeze response. He called it a paralysis produced by the influence of an omnipotent person on a defenseless, impotent subject. Influence and helplessness. Freeze, hypnosis. And Pavlov described it in his animals. When he was in the lab testing his animals, he'd bring them in, he'd pick them up at the legs, put them on the table, and they'd stay lying on their back with their, arms, their legs in the air. Frozen, just like the soldiers, in the last posture before they froze. And actually, he was traumatizing his animals. And they were also in cages, which means they were not resilient. So the persistence of reflex motor postures is typical of this. And this has a lot of importance in the somatic syndromes that one sees after trauma. If an animal recovers and is not eaten or killed after they've frozen, they go through a very stereotyped response called the freeze discharge. And I'm going to show you the freeze discharge. Okay, what happens is, is that the polar bear, when he, he, he is anesthetized to be tagged, as he comes out of it, he's lying on his back, he begins to shake like he has a grand mal seizure. And if you look at it closely, what he's doing is he is running in place. He is replicating the last act of survival before he froze. He's discharging the freeze response by completing the act of escape. Uh, the bo polar bear has just been running from a predator. It finally found a predator in its life. And it's now getting sedated. Well, it's going to collapse because of the sedation, but it will also freeze because it's being traumatized. 
And as it comes out of it, it goes through what looks like a grand mal seizure. Now, if you watch the belly, watch the belly. At the end of the discharge, it completes the whole thing with deep inspiration, expiration. See the belly collapse? It's re-regulating its autonomic nervous system. Now, if you look at it slowly, it's running in place. It's basically, it's replicating the act of escape. And it looks dramatic. It looks like a seizure. But it, in fact, is simply replicating what it needed to do to complete, in procedural memory, the events of that trauma, which therefore were extinguished, and it could go on with its life. That's all there is to it. Now, if you don't discharge the freeze response, it's very serious. It, it's not good for you. This is a little study done with baby chicks. And this investigator took these chicks and held them in his hand until they froze. They're not, they're naive. They will freeze if helpless and threatened. He then put them on the table and um, let them go and discharge the freeze response, which they did. Then he put them in a vat of water and tested how long they swam before they gave up and sank. It's a measure of resilience, very primitive test that Hans Selye did with his rats to study rat resilience. He then took a second group and didn't immobilize them, simply put them in the vat of water and measured their survival efforts through uh, the time they swam. Then he took the first, the third group of, of, uh, of chicks, immobilized them, put them down, and then poked them with a pencil until they came out of it without discharging the freeze. And when they did, he put them in the vat, they sank to the bottom. In other words, having frozen, having discharged the freeze response provides resiliency to future trauma. And in fact, the um, chicks who had discharged the freeze response swam longer than the chicks who had never frozen. So it has, a, it has a purpose in survival and in resiliency. And some animals don't discharge the freeze response routinely. These are animals such as laboratory animals, domestic animals, zoo animals, human animals. And the common feature, of course, is they all live in cages. And we live in a cultural cage, which inhibits that instinctual response, which is why we are so easily traumatized. And it is a cultural phenomenon. Indigenous tribes routinely discharge the freeze, but cultural, acculturated, urban, Human beings seldom do. Has a lot to say about the way we are and the diseases that we suffer from. Well, trauma is an aberration of memory. And to understand memory, you just need to know the basic categories of memory. You're using what's called conscious or declarative memory or explicit memory. It's memory that you, where you learn facts and events, where you store information, you take a course, and you hope you remember everything that uh, you've heard, or you, you memorize long lists if you're a medical student, and you retain them long enough for the test, and then you forget them. Because declarative memory is very fragile, very subject to decay. I remember 20% what I learned in medical school. Very subject to decay. Trauma memory is held in, in non-declarative memory, or implicit memory or procedural memory. These are the kinds of things we use to learn skills, how to learn a musical instrument, a sport. That's how we, we uh, learn that. And they tend to be hardwired. When you learn to ski, you never quite forget all the nuances. You, you ride a bike, you can ride a bike the rest of your life once you've learned the skill. The important part of procedural memory from the standpoint of trauma is body memory related to, to conditioned sensory motor responses. Now, what's that? That's Pavlov's dog salivating at the bell when the bell has been paired with food. It always involves a survival skill. Procedural memory that's related to conditioned responses is a way we learn how to survive. We learn the spotted cats in the Kalahari Desert are to be avoided if we're a gazelle, and you got one trial to learn it. So they're very hardwired once you learn them. They're there. But sometimes procedural memory involves false cues and false information. And conditioning may occur when it's not appropriate. And the trouble with trauma is that 
there's a life threat while in a state of helplessness leading to the freeze. And if you discharge the freeze response, you complete the act of survival. And, and so that experience is not part of your conditioned memory as an ongoing present threat. And in trauma, if you don't discharge the freeze, you're conditioned to every nuance of that experience. Every nuance, every sensation, every thought, every image, every movement pattern that you did is stuck in your survival bank as a false memory, as if that threat is still imminent or danger, dangerous. And as a result, if any cues from the environment, including your internal environment, arise, they throw you back into that experience. And you experience all of those things. Your neck gets stiff. Person who's, who uh, has had just had a whiplash or an auto accident, their pain is gone. They get in the car, turn on the ignition, and their neck is in spasm. The cues have triggered part of that procedural memory, pre preparing them to defend themselves, even though the threat is no longer there. And so the threat, the body experience, the emotional state, the autonomic state, where the, the fight and flight, part of the uh, autonomic arousal, all are stored in exact form in procedural memory in trauma victims, which causes a host of inexplicable symptoms because as these states of uh, trauma experiences develop and interweave with each other, all sorts of cues will produce all sorts of physical symptoms based on this procedural memory, which is false memory. And here's an example of a classic response the baboon has assumed a defensive posture just before he's about to be throttled by the uh, jaguar or the leopard. He's got his neck protected by opening his jaw and pulling his head forward and hiking his shoulders up. He's got his gut protected by folding up into a ball. This is a primitive posture of self-defense. And where do you see this posture? In old age? In chronic pain? in chronic illness, in depression. It is an instinctual activation of these muscles whose main purpose is self-protection and survival. And if you've had a lot of trauma, that's how you end up in old age. Not everybody acts. I'm, I'm really old. I stand up pretty straight. <laughs> but that's because of all the trauma work I've done. How does this work in the brain? Okay, this is the hardest part of the talk. There are a couple names I want you to remember. One is the amygdala, right down there. The other is the orbitofrontal cortex, right up there. And the anterior cingulate gyrus. Because these systems have to be manipulated in order to heal trauma. When it heals trauma, by manipulating this circuitry, this trauma circuitry. What happens is we get most of our information from the head and neck. That's why we have a head and neck is to access information. That's the main reason. Those warning signals are sent to different parts of the brain. There's a little area called the locus ceruleus, which is uh, in the reptilian or, or uh, brain stem, which sets off the whole system. It's, it, it secretes a hormone called norepinephrine and kicks off the whole fight-flight response. The amygdala is a little almond-shaped lump in the survival brain, the limbic system, whose purpose is to evaluate the emotional content of, an, of, of a piece of information and then pass it around so that it gets operated on and, and the person or animal begins the whole process of self-defense. So the amygdala is the arousal system. Without the amygdala, you don't get aroused. Uh, uh, one of these, one of the neurologists had a patient who had seizures. He did an MRI, both amygdala were calcified. So he decided, I'm going to test this person, see what they're like. And he found that that person was incapable of rage and incapable of fear. She wouldn't have survived on the desert, but she was very placid and there's no way she would ever be traumatized. You need the amygdala to experience and suffer trauma. Uh, the hippocampus is the conscious memory center. It's the part that goes first in Alzheimer's disease. That has to do with declarative memory, facts and events. And that 
when that is activated, the, the person begins to process the information of the threat. And the orbitofrontal cortex, which is on the right side, it's underneath the frontal lobe, right above the, the uh, roof of the eye or the orbit. The orbitofrontal cortex organizes the response to threat. And if you're going to modulate a threat message as to its severity, you need a big orbitofrontal cortex. And as we'll see, the orbitofrontal cortex is dependent upon maternal infant bonding for its development. And we'll talk about that. Without maternal infant bonding, your orbitofrontal cortex is physically smaller and functionally less efficient. And you will be prone throughout the life to trauma and emotional distress. The anterior cingulate gyrus is important because it is one of the systems of the limbic system in this whole process that evaluates the severity and puts a damper on the amygdala. The damper on the amygdala if it's not that serious. So you need the orbit of the cingulate to modulate the amygdala. Without it, the amygdala will go wild and every threat will be huge. And the cingulate gyrus has several important functions, the most important of which are social bonding, social interaction, and maternal infant bonding. So enlisting bonding in the process of therapy, in other words, having a social connection, is probably the, the main ingredient in the efficacy of trauma therapy because that inhibits the amygdala. And if you inhibit the amygdala, you can then extinguish a lot of these useless memories that float around in trauma. Okay, there's a lot more to say about that, but that's enough for now. <laughs> the problem with trauma is that when these messages are stuck in procedural memory, they keep circulating, and they're self-perpetuating, and they actually make the process worse by themselves. And this is a process called neurosensitization or kindling the development of self-perpetuating circuits, because trauma, once established, is self-perpetuating unless it's healed. And it will self-perpetuate both in the area of mental illness and, and emotional diseases and the area of somatic illness and physical diseases. Now, resiliency versus vulnerability, I have implied um, already, is based on the absence of a lot of trauma in early childhood. Early childhood is when we develop our resiliency or we lose it, based on our early childhood experiences, some of which are by choice, with maternal infant bonding and a stable family and the like, some of which are not by choice, uh, with surgery, injuries, and other things that happen to kids that are very traumatic and can upset the apple cart almost as much as the bonding. So we need to understand how vulnerable or resilient a person is based on their childhood. That's where the bottom line is. That's the bottom line. Children are not resilient intrinsically. They're very vulnerable. And if a lot of trauma occurs as a child, you will be very susceptible to re-traumatization as an adult, even with what we might consider relatively minor traumatic events. And Alan Shore is a psychologist who has made a career out of, out of this idea. He wrote Affect Regulation and the Origin of the Self. I'm sure, I, has, nobody has, in this room has heard of that, I assume. Good for you. And has anybody, you, did you read it? I've got a purple heart for you. Huh? <laughs> it's a really difficult book, but it's very important. He talks about the maternal infant dyad, or two as one. The, the bonding effect of face-to-face -face attunement, and I mean face-to-face, eye-to-eye attunement between the mother and the infant at a distance of about 10 inches, which is the distance between the left breast and the right eye. That seems to be the optimal distance for that attunement to occur. And if it occurs, you can watch on MRIs the right frontal orbitofrontal cortex expand and grow, even overlapping the the front of the left frontal cortex. And if it's absent, you won't see that happen. So this is how we gain resiliency. And that says a lot about other topics I talk about, including 
the American system of birthing, the hospital system of birthing, which impairs that. The le legacy of impaired attachment and developmental trauma is a lifetime of autonomic and emotional dysregulation. Well, autonomic dysregulation, the autonomic nervous system controls the entire somatic sphere and dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system was, will result in dysregulation of the endocrine system, the immune system, the entire disease-based function of the body. And this is what the autonomic nervous system looks like in trauma. It's a rocky road. In fact, if one looks at the dotted line as the smooth cycling of sympathetic and parasympathetic states, which we call homeostasis, the optimal static function of the body systems. By the way, vibration makes all sorts of sense because the entire universe operates on a sine wave, and so does vibration, and so does the autonomic nervous system, and the estrus cycle, and the cortisol cycle, and the moon, and the planets, they all operate on a vibrational frequency. And I think this is one reason why vibration is a valid way of looking at the healing process in trauma. In trauma, if you put a, an input in that's excessive, it results in gradual cycling of the autonomic nervous system to the extremes of its capacity. And that's this, this regulatory state that typifies trauma. And it typifies all the diseases of trauma such as fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, esophageal reflux, uh, interstitial cystitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, on and on and on, immune disease and the like. These are all autonomic systemic dysregulatory syndromes. And the problem with them is there's no end point. You, you take a test, depending on where the cycle is, the test will show one thing. You take it in another type part of the cycle, it shows something else. So doctors don't believe these diseases exist. They think they're functional or psychosomatic because they can't find an endpoint to pin their picture on. They've got to have a picture and an endpoint. And it's not like just what's the blood sugar, what's your liver function test. It is a cycling syndrome where every part of that cycle has some pathological symptom associated with it. These disorders, are they treatable as well? And if so, what modalities do you recommend? Well, all these physical syndromes that we talked about, the RSD, the chronic myofascial pain, the irritable bowel, all of these syndromes are treatable with trauma therapy. Because if you treat the trauma therapy, you are healing the autonomic nervous system, you are healing the brain and its tendency to throw you into these different syndromes. So you don't try to treat the syndrome through allopathic medical treatment. You can use things like acupuncture and alternative medicine, but you've got to approach the trauma. You've got to extinguish the memories because trauma is based on a conditioned response, fear conditioning. All of these responses are survival-based memories that are false, they don't really work, but they're still in the survival brain. And how do we cure those? We extinguish them. So how do we do that? How do we do that? So what do all trauma therapies have to have in order to extinguish fear? You need to shut down the amygdala. And when the amygdala is shut down, like with her, and you then visualize the traumatic event or any of the procedural memories that are, that are part of the dissociation capsule, there won't be arousal. Because every time you do that, the amygdala lights up in the traumatized individual and you're re-traumatized. But in this case, if you can shut down the amygdala, you've got a, a moment of grace. And during that time, that procedural memory will bubble up like bubbles in a glass of champagne, pop and disappear. It will be extinguished. You will have ex achieved fear extinction for whatever the context of that therapeutic session was at that moment. So, how do we extinguish them? How do we shut down the amygdala? Well, we know what inhibits it, right? There are lots of things we can do. Mm -hmm. Ritual is used by indigenous tribes in order to heal the tribe.
It involves movement patterns. It involves vocalization. It involves um, the treatment of the tribal members in the same specific replication of a process that they've adopted as one of their own. And it results in down-regulation of the amygdala because they are in a state of deep, deep attunement in trance state. The second one has to do with crossing the hemispheres with bilateral stimulation. When you're in an arousal state, the right half of the brain lights up the limbic system. Even the parts that are inhibiting the amygdala light up because they're on, on call and on, online as well. When you are in a state of calm, the left side lights up. And when the right side is lights up, the left dorsal, dorsal lateral frontal cortex and the broca's area specifically are inhibited. You bring those on and the right side is inhibited. So if you can bring the brain back and forth, you bring it in and out of potential arousal. And if you keep it in the left side some of the time, you're providing a state where the amygdala is inhibited. So crossing the hemispheres. EMDR uses crossing the hemispheres. That's its main thing. That's its main thing. It also involves empowerment. You use statements of empowerment to, during the testing. So you're inhibiting the amygdala through a number of different techniques. Uh, I happen to think that EMDR is associated with an increased incidence of flooding, especially in its earlier applications. Um, so it's been modified somewhat to accommodate for that. But it contains the essential ingredients by virtue of these features. And it does involve attunement to a significant degree as the therapist follows the patient closely. Now, one of the techniques that came out of the MDR is that of brain spotting, David Grand's technique. David Grand found that when he moved his hands more slowly, he began to pick up somatic responses in the patient. An eye blink, a twitch, a somatic manifestation. And finding those required that he become more attuned to the patient. And I found that his technique really amplified the attunement factor as a result. So that incorporated that. He also found that there are spots in the environment where procedural memories for trauma are held. And he found, as did my therapists who are doing other types of techniques, that these little areas, which we can call boundary ruptures, ruptures in the perceptual surround, if you wish, will, are reflective of a procedural memory for that event. It may be visual, but it also may be perceptual, because I think we do perceive even things in back of us mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a state where we're, we're focusing on the surround. And so he found states that would be uh, able to be extinguished by careful exposure with attunement and with the patient coming in and out of that state uh, and then extinguishing the boundary rupture, per se. So that has many of the essential ingredients. Uh, it also involves movement from right to left as well.